rescue earlier. Should sitting presidents be stripped of diplomatic immunity from prosecution? We're getting a lot of reaction on social media. I'm going to go through some of them after our discussion. But before we kick off our discussion tonight, let me hand you over to my colleague Fatia Mohamed Nur, who is on the other end of our studio tonight, and she is uh, armed, shall I say, with a list of uh, presidents and former presidents who are either who have either been prosecuted or facing a prosecution at the moment. Fatia, good evening. Good evening, Yusuf. Of course, today we are just going to tell you the list of presidents who are in jail and are on trial currently. All right, so definitely now we want to start with the famous Jacob Zuma. Now, Jacob Zuma is the immediate former president of South Africa. He appeared, on, uh, he appeared in the courts on April 6th. Um, he faces 16 counts of corruption, uh, fraud, and money laundering. But the case has been adjourned until 8th June. So let me just give you a brief history of his corruption, of his corruption scandals. Now, there was a famous arms deal that took place in the year 1999 when he moved from being a provincial minister to a deputy president. He's also accused of accepting 783 illegal payments uh, during that time also. His financial uh, advisor by the name Shabir Sheikh was accused or rather found guilty of trying to solicit bribe on his behalf and was jailed in 2005. But at the same time though, in the recent past, in 2016, the court found him, uh, that the court ruled that he had breached uh, the oath of office by using government money to, um, to fund his rural home in Nkandla, but reports also indicate that he later repaid that money. But apart from the corruption scandals uh, with, during his presidency, in the year 2005, he was charged with rape, a case that was later thrown uh, the court ruled that the act was consensual and basically he was not guilty. Let's move on to I Lawrence Bagbo of Ivory Coast. He is the president, uh, he was the former president of Cote d'Ivoire from 2000 until his arrest in April 2011. He was charged with crimes against humanity and the trial began in the ICC on 28th January 2016. Now let's move to now to the global view now. There is Park Gen Hae. She was a former president of South Korea, actually the first female president of South Korea and was impeached in March 2017 and has been sentenced to 24 years in prison and a fine of 16 million shilling, million dollars which is an equivalent to 18 million shillings, 18 billion shillings in Kenya. But a brief history also about this lady is her father was also a president, actually the third president of South Korea. And uh, after her mother was assassinated in 1974, she took, up this, she took up the post as the first lady at the age of 22. And let's move on to Brazil. Luis Inacio Lula, he was elected president from 2003 to 2011, and he was convicted to 12 years in jail. But he is, of course, facing uh, also corruption scandals, the fact that he accepted uh, a luxury apartment as a bribe and was also involved in the car wash campaign. That is basically the investigation into money laundering and fraud. For now, though, let me hand you back to Yusuf Ibrahim in studio for more on the discussion. Thank you, Fatia Mohamed Nur, for that. Always a pleasure to have you on the show. Now, I'll choose to start from uh, Park Yun Hai, and this is where uh, the former so, so, uh, South Korean leader, and this is where I'm going, going, I'm going to bring in both Javas Bigambo and Mark Bichach into this discussion. First of all, good evening, gentlemen, and welcome to the program. Thank you so Yusuf. much. Thank so, you. Javas, let me begin with you. And uh, let's begin from South Korea. This is a country whose judiciary sentenced a former president, that is Park uh, Unhai, to 24 years in prison. First of all, how huge is this kind of a decision? Let's begin from there. That is a very important decision on matters justice and governance uh, for the entire world. Now, before even uh, Park was sentenced to 24 years in prison, her secret confidant had been sentenced to 20 years in prison, facing close to 15 similar charges like Park. I consider it this way, that the act of 
taking former leaders or presidents to court and having them sentenced as Park was, one is an act of love and is an act of patriotism. It is the love of country, the love of justice, the love of the rule of law that necessitates such actions being taken. When we see it happening, for example, in places like Brazil and the way it has happened in other parts of the world or even situations where leaders in office who are found culpable or even implicated in matters graft stepping down or resigning from office, public office, for purposes of being held accountable and actually letting the justice cause takes, uh, to take root, it demonstrates a heightened sense of responsibility, mm -hmm. maturity, and appreciation of the rule of law, mm -hmm. very different from how it's happening here in Africa. Yes, Javas, let me bring Mark into this conversation. Now, Mark, there's this common principle that everybody, I mean, no one is above the law, or that no one is above the Constitution. But in most cases, it seems that it's just on paper. But with this kind of a ruling, South Korea has confirmed uh, exactly that, that no one is above the Constitution, right? Indeed, they have uh, demonstrated that, but the beauty of the South Korean case and Prisoner 503, as Park is commonly known there, is the fact that this was driven, number one, by members of the Fifth Estate mm -hmm. who exposed the corruption within government. It was led by the South Korean people who came out by the millions uh, to demand for a resignation. It was exposed by a police force was, was, that was gallant enough to investigate not just the president, but a titanic business such as Samsung, which was implicated in this corruption. Mm -hmm. And this is really a, a trend that you will see across the cases that we look at tonight, a collaboration between the people, uh, the fifth estate, and the investigative organs, and then finally the judiciary, in deciding to do the right thing. And this is probably the right mix of being able to deal with corruption, because indeed, no one is above the law, and most important, no one is above the law of nature or the law of God because at some point it's going to get you. Javas, what does this say about institutions like the judiciary, for instance, uh, in South Korea and by extension the people of South Korea themselves because there's something that is totally you know, not practical in a continent like, like Africa. We're going to talk about Zuma shortly. Well, basically it demonstrates that we have independent institutions there institutions that are respected by the people and even by the leaders in office. It also demonstrates that those institutions are strong as well as the individuals who man or who run those institutions. We need, as it is even here in Africa, we need strong institutions, mm -hmm. but we also need strong men and women to lead or take charge of those institutions. And then the respect of the term independence of those institutions. If you look at here in Africa, and especially here in Kenya, we have got even such terms as independent institutions in our constitution, yet those terms remain purely cosmetic. So it demonstrates that we've got so much to learn in terms of best practices across the world. Mm -hmm. When you look at, for example, the case of the United States of Amer America, just the other day, the FBI uh, pounced on and actually you know, took charge and ransacked the offices of one of Trump's lawyers. That demonstrates that an institution that is free, that is properly funded, is capable of doing so much for social justice and good governance. Mm -hmm. Now, let me pick a, an institution, for example, here in Kenya, the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights. Since its commencement, that institution was known, was thorough, and was serious with its work. And it was sufficiently funded. But because of fear by part of the individuals who are in government, especially the executive, etc., they tried to have manacles around that, that institution, including even parliament today. Mm -hmm. Today, the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights is underfunded, and even the way it's driven, it has kind of re been reduced to a research institution. You might even be forgiven to think that it's only a branch or a department of a university here in, the, in Kenya. Mm -hmm. Well said, uh, J uh, Javas there. Now, uh, Mark, I'd like to play, the se play back the same question to you, but even as you react to that, because this seems, you know, the development in South Korea seems quite like a dramatic uh, fall for this leader in question because she is a lady whose father was a president, actually was the founding father of Korea. He served between 1969 and 1979. That is Park Chun-hee. It seems no one is immune there. Uh, the, the truth of the matter is this. If you look at 
the Brazilian case and the South Korean case, and they always say the devil is in the detail. Both Brazil and South Korea had these corruption cartels that had entrenched themselves within the chambers of, of the executive. Brazil is a classic example for years. Petrobras, the, the biggest uh, oil, oil company, had siphoned off money through shady deals and put uh, a 3% to make sure that they were bribing politicians. It was not something that was a day old. It was not something that was a year old. It was something that was practiced over decades. But what the key, the, the key thing that broke the camel's back was the will of the people. When the people began to say that in Brazil there must be justice, in South Korea there must be justice, that they moved the wheels of justice to bring um, the, the results that we're seeing now. So what am I saying? That the reality in the African continent, if we are going to be serious about the delivering ourselves from the chains of corruption, we must be strong-willed and fortified against the, the people who are implicated in corruption. We must be the same people who are able to push the gauntlet to the last mile to make sure that someone is held to account. And that's what happened in South Korea. Credit to their institutions because they stepped in and they were able to stand up to the, to the challenge, meaning that, number one, held investigation in a manner that could stand up in a court of law. That took a lot of courage on the part of the police officers, on the people in charge of the investigation. Secondly, the judges being able to rule in the favor of the law and in the common good of their countries. That took a lot of courage and it had to, they had to stand against the oligarchs and the powerful businesses that would have wished otherwise. And this is yes. the direction Africa needs to go. Now, Javas, Mark talks about the need to respect the will of the people and speak about the will of the people let me return you back to South Korea I don't know why I like this story there apparently more than two million people demonstrated wanting you know this leading question out of office and perhaps what can you say about that is this a reflection of a society uh, that is intoler that is not tolerant you know that is intolerant to corruption and perhaps a swift judicial system that is ready to prosecute anyone without it's, without checking at you know the position they serve in a society perhaps it's a cocktail of issues mm -hmm. one there is a question of a people appreciating the place of law and accountability but it's also a reflection of a people who are fed up with poor leadership or poor governance it's a people who are raising themselves to the high levels of appreciation of excellence in leadership. But beyond that, it is also a people who know that when they pay their taxes to the government, that government must not misappropriate their money. They are not chained to issues such as ethnic uh, inclinations or stuck in ethnic enclaves to the extent that it clouds their thinking. Here in Kenya, for example, and even across Africa, we realize that we are a people and we have leaders who have got minds mercuric like the clouds. They keep on shifting, being pushed by winds of time, winds of interests, and even winds of narrowness to the extent that somebody who has been charged with, say, graft here in Kenya comes to a community and says that it is a community that is being haunted or being witch, witch, witch hunted, and then the people buy into that kind of cheap excuse. Now, I say it this way, that accountability is the cutlery with which responsibility is eaten. The moment Africa will come to that appreciation, it's the moment that we'll see things happening, whether it's in Kenya, whether it's in Uganda, whether it's in South Africa, or whether it's in the West, the way it's happening in South Korea, the way it's happened in Brazil, and even the way things are happening in the United States of America. That is the kind of leadership that we need. That's the kind of citizenry that oh. is awakened that we need here in Africa. Other than that, the question here is, is it just purely a question of skin color and racism, etc.? I have brought myself to a very serious appreciation. One, that governance is not an African problem. But I think governance has, you know, Africa has got a governance problem and vice versa. Mm -hmm. When you look at questions of governance, you realize that why is it that questions of social justice, good governance, accountability, are more in Africa than they are, say, in uh, Asia or in Europe or in the United States of America? When you look at Kenya, 
when you look at South Africa, when you look at Sudan, when you look at Uganda, when you look at the Democratic Republic of Congo, you wonder what is it that is the problem with the African dress in matters governance. Mm -hmm. So when you look at how the challenges are there, here in Kenya, I'll give this example. We have got a nearly 264 articled constitution, and very soon we are going to a referendum to add more articles, yet governance is still a problem here in Kenya. Mm -hmm. Go to the United Kingdom. You realize that they have got a barely written constitution, but their appreciation on the tenets of good governance and constitutionalism remains unmatched. Go to the United States of America, a constitution that is about 40 pages, compared to ours that's about 300 or 280 pages plus, mm -hmm. yet governance is a big problem here. So it, takes, it tells one thing, that the laws are not necessarily the problem. In fact, even policies are not necessarily the problem. Mm -hmm. The problem is the attitude of the people. Yes. The problem is the attitude of the citizens. Yes, I and think I think you've delivered a point there, Javas, and I'd like Mark to react to that. And Mark, as you react to that, uh, the people were talking about, you know, the need to have strong institutions. And case in point in Kenya, we already have a problem with the electoral body that is IABC. So the, the chairman would like to hear this or not. This is a commission that is in tatters at the moment. I mean, how can this country, and by extension, so many other African countries, make sure that, you know, these institutions are free from politics? One of the things that I find is very sad about the African continent is a saying that is popular here in Kenya, and I'm sure it's popular in a lot of Africa, mm -hmm. where we were told as children that children are to be seen and not to be heard. We were brought up in a society where whenever someone wore the hat of authority, they were beyond question. They were like the Pope, the very representation of God upon this earth. No small wonder that every person who runs for political office office is somehow anointed by one god or another. He is knighted as a tribal elder. And the problem of doing that is we create sacred cows. We create certain people that cannot be touched. And this is true, especially when the person is aged or when the person claims to represent an entire tribe or an entire population. So what happens then is that we become shy of beginning to actually ask hard questions. And I'll ask, for example, in the question of the Electoral Commission of Kenya, the Independent Electoral Boundaries Commission of Kenya, and the IIEBC as it was previously known, it is known for a fact that in 2007, Samuel Kuvitu botched that election. He failed to deliver the results of the election in a manner that was credible, as mm. was detailed in the report of Kriegler. We sent politicians to The Hague. We sent politicians to pay the price. But no one in the IEBC even spent a day in the docks of, of justice simply because we have this idea that if someone is in authority, they are somehow guarded by the powers of heaven themselves. And it is this fear of dealing with our past and dealing with our fathers that is the problem. If you look at the case of Brazil, President Lula's term was one of the most prosperous terms in the time in, in, in the Brazilian history. But when it was discovered that during his term, he was in bed with Petrobras in the uh, car wash scandal, as it was called, he was thrown in prison. My question to my fellow Africans is this. My question to my fellow Kenyans is this. Where is justice? When we, on one hand, clap for Matiba, but elect the people he fought against, this is the question. This is why Julius Balem was asking, give us a sign. And mm -hmm. I'm here to give Africans a sign. You need no other sign. Look speaking, yourself in the mirror. You are the reason we are where we are. Yes, Mark Bichachi, the very strong point. And speaking about Julius Malema, this is a man who was complained time and again that in South Africa, no high profile individual has been successfully prosecuted when it comes to corruption. But now, Javis, there's one man who is in the dock that is uh, the former, the immediate former South African President Jacob Zuma. Apparently, he's facing about 16 charges. His case has been adjourned to 8th of June. I mean, this is another precedence in Africa. I mean, it's not something that, that is very common in Sub-Saharan Africa, right? Whenever much it rains, the rain will never wash away the spots of a leopard. When Zuma was taking office, he was surrounded, 
choked by all sorts of allegations, whether it was corruption cases before, whether it was matters rape, and all these issues dogged his entire presidency until it ended before his term was supposed to end. When you look at all those issues, whether you want to look at it through the Encandler report, whether you want to look at it through the lenses of the state capture and the Guptas, you realize that Zuma is a leader and a president who had a lack of appreciation of proper governance for South Africa. And you know, problem with us, especially in Africa, is that we do not like calling every sin by its own name. If a leader, whatever high office he occupies or she occupies, has done things that are belittling good governance, the rule of law, and constitutionalism itself, they need to be called out. It is proper, it is fitting, it is necessary that former President Zuma should be taken to the courts and in fact, the rule of law in its entirety should take its course. And if he is found to be guilty, then let him find himself being faced with the harshest penalty that those courts or the Constitution and the Penal Code of South Africa provides. That will be a lesson for the people of South Africa and for other leaders and other public officers in the Republic of South Africa. If he is let scot free, then the culture of impunity will be entrenched. And you got to love somebody like Malema. Even though he comes across as a rabble rouse and cantankerous, you will appreciate the fact that he speaks for the commoner. He called out Zuma throughout his term whenever it was proper and necessary for him to be called out. Mm -hmm. Looking at it through those lenses, then other African countries too need to learn these lessons. Yes. Here in Kenya, mm -hmm. it is shameful and a pity that many public servants try even to use the courts to try and clean themselves or delay the course of justice. When you yes. look at the cases of, for example, of IBC, mm. and the other day, former chief executive of South Swago uh, was appearing to try and explain himself. You wonder why is it that it must take eternity and a day for leaders to be taken to the courts or be brought to book on account of irresponsibility under them when they are holding public office. Javas, those are very strong points as well. And speaking about uh, Julius Malema and Zuma Fesov, um, I'm talking to you, Mark, now. I'd like to, you to react to that also very in a very, in a very short time because you're almost out of time here. And it's good to mention that during uh, Winnie Medi the late Winnie Medike Zala's uh, burial, Malema didn't mention the name Zuma even once. So I'd like you to react to Zuma's prosecution in just a minute. We're almost out of time. Jacob Zuma is the classic example that a man who cannot pronounce beginning or <laughs> articulate the number 1,700,000 can manage to pull the wool, over, uh, the wool over the eyes of a nation for almost 8 to 10 years. Now, how was he able to do that? It's very simple. The South African nation fell for the trap that the Cossas had sat on their heads for too long, and now the proud Zulu nation had a dancing warrior to save them from the shadows of not being in political power. That is the first trick. There is no way one person is going to sit in office and claim to represent an entire tribe. And that is how the South African people were fooled. But what is critical about South Africa is that the DA, the Democratic Alliance, Julius Malemba, and many voices within South Africa were never cowed. They never shied away from speaking the truth. And this is where Africa must begin to return to. We must remember the voices of Jaramogi Goginga Odinga. We must remember the voices of Waikibaki in 1992. We must remember Wamala Kijana. We must remember all of these heroes and how they stood up and spoke the truth all the way from the 1960s to date that we enjoy the freedoms we enjoy today. And therefore, the challenge for the African nation is this. Mm -hmm. Will you keep quiet? For as long as we keep quiet, yes. the new apartheid leaders mm -hmm. who are taking over Africa mm -hmm. will push us into tribal well, apartheid. Well we said. need to stand up yes. for ourselves. Well said, Mark. 
Thank you very much for your input. Always a pleasure to have you on board. That is Mark Bichachi, uh, com political communication strategist, as well as Javas Bigabu, who is a governance expert. I couldn't even try to interject their point of views there. They both have very valid point of view. Many thanks uh, for your input. And finally, on our Twitter poll earlier, we did ask you, should sitting presidents be stripped of diplomatic immunity for prosecution? At uh, Salim Duke says the obvious answer is yes, but we all know that it's impossible. In most African countries, the bail motion, whatever you call it, will be shut down. I repeat, shut down. At uh, Felix Miguel says, yes, 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 this will be a sign of endeavoring to see a corruption-free world and uh, especially Africa. Uh, one final one from uh, at Hambi254 says presidents won't be able to dispense the intense, function, intense functions of office effectively with numerous litigations that they will be required to attend to. Many thanks for your feedback there. And that brings us to the end of our program tonight. Many thanks for watching. Of course, this program is aired every Monday to Thursday from, from 10 to 11 p.m. See you again tomorrow, someplace, sometime. Bye-bye for now. Enjoy the rest of your night.